And as the number of COVID cases continues to rise, some health experts say there is no need for people to panic. Joining us over Skype this morning to explain is trauma and emergency physician, Dr. Kelly Victory. Dr. Victory, good morning. Thanks for joining us as always. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Jason. So we have seen here locally at Pacific Beach, uh, one of our very popular local uh, beaches, a what they are considering to be a spike in cases. But you say that's no need for panic. Why is that? Right. I just think we need to put it in context, Jason. I, I'm not trying to underplay the importance of this virus or the fact that many people can become ill with it. Fortunately, what we are seeing is a continuation of what we've had from the beginning, which is that somewhere around 80 to 85 percent of the people who contract the virus actually have few, if any, symptoms whatsoever. So although we are seeing an uptick in quote unquote cases, that is highly reflective of the fact that we are testing hand over fist hundreds of thousands of, pay, of people around the country every day. So an uptick in cases by itself doesn't mean much if it doesn't translate into people becoming significantly ill and needing hospitalization. So let's start with that. In the state of California, for example, although there's been a significant uptick in cases because of the testing, hospitals are not being largely overrun at all. In fact, we are seeing hospital census actually plateau and decline. And that's not just for regular beds, but even for ICU beds related to COVID. And based on recent numbers, is it, is it true that the, uh, the number of deaths, the death rate from COVID-19 is coming down? Absolutely. And that's what we aren't focusing on. With all of these sensational headlines, we, we, the numbers lack context. And that's the problem. For example, there was a big headline saying that now California is number three in terms of COVID uh, cases and deaths following right behind New York and New Jersey. Well, let's put that in context. California has twice the population of New York yet has only a fourth of the total deaths. So if you do it on a per capita basis, that means that California actually has per capita one eighth the number of deaths that New York does. So I think if you don't put those numbers in context, they can look very scary. Uh, we are seeing an uptick in the number of cases because we are testing a huge number of people who ha would never have been tested back in February, March, and April because we didn't have adequate testing supplies back then. Now, anyone essentially who wants a test can go in and get one. So what we are seeing is lots of asymptomatic young people between the ages of 18 and 49. That's where the bulk of the new cases are coming from. Fortunately, those people in a large part are not getting sick are not requiring hospitalization and certainly are not dying from COVID. You mentioned putting the numbers into perspective. What about those people who die from COVID-19 as opposed to those who die, those who die with COVID-19? Well, you're bringing up an incredibly important point, Jason. And overall, when we look at that, the, the death number from, from COVID is highly suspect because so many of those people, number one, are in those really elderly age categories. We say you're at risk when you're over 65, but a huge percentage of the deaths have happened in people over 80 or 85, and those with significant comorbidities. Not to say that those deaths are less tragic, but the reality is many of those people would have died with something else or of something else. So I think the, the important piece is going to be at the end of this year, when we look at the total number of deaths in any state or in the country, compared to the total number of deaths that we have in any other year, the delta, the difference, the number of excess deaths, as we would call them, is going to be relatively small. In other words, we're going to find out that 150,000, 200,000 Amer more Americans didn't die in 2020 than die in any other year. In other words, these people likely would have and were dying of something else. And with regard to treatment, I have to ask you about hydroxychloroquine. Two days ago, we had this group of doctors on the steps of the Supreme Court talking about how, and, and doctors and, and, and people in general who I've been following on social media for months have been talking about this. They had older parents, they got sick, they took this drug, and within two days they were asymptomatic and they felt great. So why aren't we using this more? 
You're right. And I am not here to plug hydroxychloroquine per se, but I will tell you, I was supposed to be in Washington with that group. I'm very well connected with them. I meet with them video, via video uh, a couple times a month at least. And amongst all of us, all practicing physicians, we have put together a body of data that is enormous. So the, although there has not yet been some huge randomized control trial about hydroxychloroquine, there are tens of thousands of cases of patients who have been treated successfully with it amongst all of these different physicians. And we are finding that hydroxychloroquine, a drug that's incredibly safe, it's been FDA approved for more than 60 years, uh, used to treat everything from malaria to rheumatoid arthritis and lupus with very few side effects. It is now being remarkably effective when used to treat COVID if it's used early and in conjunction with zinc. So uh, it's an incredibly well-tolerated drug. It's about $12 for the entire course, cost me about $12 to treat a patient uh, for the entire course with hydroxychloroquine versus some other medications that we are uh, looking at or that are being investigated that are upwards of you know $2,000 per patient. So I think there's a lot to be said about hydroxychloroquine, a drug that's been around for six decades, tried and true, many, many studies on it for other medical uh, applications, dirt cheap, uh, and I don't know why you would not want to try that as a first-line drug if it's available. So if you had a patient come to you who was symptomatic and wasn't feeling well, and you diagnosed COVID-19, would you necessarily put that person on hydroxychloroquine? I would, if there was no reason not to, absolutely. Uh, the, the reports are remarkable. People turn around very, very quickly. They go from having uh, fevers and feeling lousy to being uh, without a fever and feeling great, uh, sometimes within a matter of hours and certainly within 24 to 36 hours. So unless someone had a uh, designated contraindication, uh, some underlying issue that would preclude them from taking hydroxychloroquine, I would absolutely try it. Uh, in many, many countries, Jason, hydroxychloroquine is so, used so commonly for other things, particularly malaria, in almost every other country, it's over the counter, the way we have Tylenol and aspirin in the United States. So the, the fear that has been sort of amped up about hydroxychloroquine, I think is, is really largely political because in much of the world, hydroxychloroquine is an over-the-counter medication like Tylenol is here. So we essentially, when it comes to COVID-19 and finding a cure, this is the closest thing we got and it's very effective. Is that accurate? Yes, I believe that that's very accurate. And when people say, well, where's your, uh, you know, multi-center random controlled trial, placebo trial, say, right, we don't have that for COVID yet, but we the tests were done by the FDA when when hydroxychloroquine was FDA approved six decades ago. So the safety profile has already been determined. That is not in question. And is, is, there's no question about the safety profile of this FDA approved drug. The only question is to get the studies in, the data in on how well it works for COVID-19. And we know, uh, and it's more, far more than anecdotally because of the number of patients who've been treated, that when given early and given in conjunction with zinc, that it is profoundly effective. All right, Dr. Kelly Victory, thank you so much as always. We do appreciate your time and uh, your perspective greatly. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.